In Isaiah chapter 56 verse 7, God says, My house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. Here we are in the studio of LLBN, gathered together to worship, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each one of you for joining us as we pray, as we praise God, and as we worship Him. This is an hour of worship where we all can get together, and I thank you, and I want to wish you a special blessing during these Sabbath hours or whenever you watch us and worship with us. To guide us and direct us in our worship today, we have a praise team that's made up of Paulette Humalon, a vocalist, and Philip Pitcher on the piano. They have given us their talents in the past, and we are glad that they could come all the way from Riverside, beating this heavy traffic just to join with, with us and praise God. The opening prayer will be by Mana Manukian, the offering appeal by Roger Schwelt, children's story by Sam Young, and the scripture reading by Sheila Hodgkin. The text is found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40. And of course, the, lo the sermon by David Smith, David Smith. Once again, worship is our privilege and God's pleasure. Let's worship him. The title of the sermon, Stranger in Your Gate. He welcomes each one of us. Prayer before we go to sleep. Every child's prayer, 
and every grandmother's prayer. This prayer is not for me. Too many people on this day don't have a peaceful place to stay. Let all fighting cease that your children may see peace when the tears of sorrow. Sometimes, no matter how much we pray and we say that we give everything to God, our human tendency is to still do what we want to do, right? I know I do. <laughs> um, and yet, he always proves us. He always proves to us that he knows better than we do. He always has a better plan. Amen? Just when I have given up, the truth is coming clear. You If 
has been a test I cannot see the reason But maybe knowing I don't know Is part of getting through I try to do what's best And faith has made it easy To see the best thing I can do Is put my trust in you For you Let us continue the worship with prayer. Our gracious God, we come to you humbly to learn, praise, and worship you. Open our hearts and minds so that we are filled with your word. Let the Holy Spirit fill us so we become the vessels and light to this world. We pray that our speaker tonight at worship will be filled with your words and be with him physically and guide every one of us that are praising you to become a beacon for your worship. And I humbly ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The bystander effect. Have you heard of the bystander effect? It's where when there's a crisis going on, the more people you have around looking at the crisis, the less likely the individual is going to do something about it because, well, they think someone else is going to do something about it. It's funny, just happened today. I was driving down the 10 freeway, the westbound. My 16-year-old daughter was in the passenger seat, and uh, there was a couch in the number three lane in the westbound freeway, and we passed it by. And I, I told Nicole, I said, call 911. Let them know that there's a couch on the freeway. There's a big couch. Um, and she said, Dad, somebody's already probably called about it. I said, no, call. Well, we called, and it turned out someone had called, but it was, it was the wrong address or it was the wrong place for, uh, for the couch. So it was a good thing that we called. You, you know, I work in the hospital, uh, critical care, and uh, we have something called the bystander effect there as well. When someone is, goes into cardiac arrest, uh, we, we call it code blue. And we're trained that when we go to the hospital, when we go to these patients that are in cardiac arrest, we don't just say, somebody do chest compressions, somebody get a uh, epinephrine, somebody write this stuff down. No, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to point to somebody and say, you start chest compressions. Because if we just say somebody do this, everyone's going to think it's going to be somebody else and nothing's going to get done. I want to make sure that that doesn't happen because as you are sitting at home, you might be thinking that you're a bystander and you're certainly not a bystander when you're watching this on TV. We want you to become involved. Uh, 
And so just like I would say in a code situation, you do chest compressions, I'm going to say, you at home, call that number on the screen because we depend on you to fund the ministry of LLBN. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, please bless this ministry, LLBN, as it uh, puts your word onto the airwaves. Please bless it in every way in thy name. Amen. Naomi was at Albuquerque Airport. She was tired. It had been a long, long day, and she had two hours delay, two hours delay in her plane. So she wandered around the airport, wandered around the airport, and then as she was wondering, she heard over the internet, the intercom saying, if there's anyone in gate A4, that knows Air Blake, please, club, please, please come. She says, I know a little Arabic. By the way, that's my gate. So she rushes to the gate. And then she finds this lady. Ah! Ah! Naomi comes down, puts her hand on the lady, and says, what's wrong? And the, the, there was a number of... Uh, flight attendants and people around trying to calm her down, but she had no calming. Ah! So Naomi says, she, does she understand? She says, well, she speaks Arabic. Nobody understands. So I can speak. So she puts her hand on the lady and starts speaking Arabic to her. The lady looks and immediately calms down and says, what's wrong? My plane is canceled. My plane is canceled. I need to get to El Paso because I have a sur surgery. If I don't get the surgery, I'm going to die. Naomi ah! <laughs> says, no, no, no. It hasn't been canceled. It's just been delayed for two hours. <sighs> delayed for two hours. Okay, okay. And they start talking. And Naomi puts, pulls out her phone. Let's call your, your son. And so pushes the button, calls the son, and tells the son, the plane has been delayed. You need to talk to your mom. So hands the phone to the mom. Mom tells us the phone has been, that the, the plane has been delayed. Calms down. Then Naomi says, let's call my dad. He speaks Arabic. Calls the dad. And Naomi knew a little bit of Arabic because she grew up, she's a Jew, grew up in Israel. This is a Palestinian. Most of them don't like each other, but in that case, they were friends. They became friends, got the phone for the father. They speak Arabic together. Slowly, the tip of her, her, her lips started smiling. And then she pulls out this big bag. You know what it is? It's cookies. These, these Arabic cookies were sugar cookies. She started giving it to everybody. There was the Argentinian lady there. There was the, the Mexican lady from uh, Laredo. There was the American lady with the two children. They all got the cookies. And pretty soon, all of them had this all fluffy white powder all over them. Then the, the airline broke out the, the juices in the water, and the children got it. They were all laughing when they were all tired before. They were all laughing at each other. They were rejoicing. They were having a great time. Why? Because somebody spoke their language. Somebody spoke their language and cared enough. You, my children, is that somebody that speaks that language. When you smile at somebody and say, hi, it warms somebody's heart. Can I help you? That warms somebody's heart. You can be the smile for the world, you can be that person that speaks the language so that the rest of the world can smile and be a big, happy family. So go, smile, give those little cookies, and speak the people's language. Our scripture um, this evening is from Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then the king 
will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That music takes us right to the throne of heaven, doesn't it? Thank you so much for that uh, uh, great blessing to us. My brother Dan and I grew up, as you know, in uh, Bangkok. And uh, there's one tourist experience that he and I have experienced many, many times. Uh, we call it locally the Klong Trip. It's actually the canal tour boat ride all through downtown Bangkok on the uh, very muddy, very polluted Chao Phraya River. And Dan and I have uh, 
have been on that tour a lot of times. Uh, and it is, uh, it's nothing to see as far as the ambiance of the river, but uh, there's a lot of beautiful temples there that you can see. And uh, there's a, a lot of very interesting entrepreneurial uh, franticness. Um, but I want you to look at this one picture here. Uh, right there. Uh, wrong way. I'm sorry. Wrong direction. I am so sorry. There. Um, and uh, it's, the, it's the poverty all along that muddy river, the Chao Pira River. And Dan and I were in a boat once looking at these people living on the edge of the Chao Pira River. And just as we, as we saw the, the, the rampant poverty there, it, it struck me. Except for just an accident of DNA, I could have been born there instead of here. It just, a, just a freak nature of DNA where I was conceived in uh, uh, Palm Springs, California, and born about a mile and a half from here at Loma Linda University Hospital, except for that, I could so easily have been born instead on that dirty, muddy, Klong River, there except for the grace of God. Now, I want to give you a little David Smith financial report um, this evening. I'm 66 years old. How many nights do you think I have spent outdoors, homeless, no place to sleep. Zero. 66 years old. I'm embarrassed to say this. How many meals do you think I have missed in 66 years? Zero. How many times have I been in jeopardy of being thrown into prison unjustly or not able to get a fair trial? Or, or being in lockup and didn't know what to call it, who to call in to get, to, to get any kind of legal help. How many times has that happened to me? Zero. How many times have I had a bill come along, an invoice, a, a, a desperate financial moment where I just didn't know what to do, didn't know where I could turn, couldn't pay that bill? How many times has that happened? Zero. I've lived a very blessed life. I wasn't born on the Chao Priya River in downtown Bangkok. I had a moment of uh, uh, marital insecurity once, and I, I said to my wife, Lisa, I said, honey, why, why do you marry me? And she gave me a strange look and said, that's pretty easy. She said, you had a house, a car, and a job. And I said, uh, did you love me? Well, I, I learned to love you, she said. I, I learned to love you. I'll tell you what. The Bible has a lot to say about the people who live in poverty on the Chao Priya River in Bangkok, and people who live in desperate straits right here in California, and people who are, are broke and struggling, and widows, and orphans, and, and immigrants. Bible has a lot to tell all of us about these people that we all know were in the world around us. And the minute I began to pick this as a possible topic, I said to myself, oh boy, David, I said, this could so easily become a, a political discussion, immigrants, what do we think about that? I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, but I want to give you to this evening four very important words that I think God has for you and me. Now, first of all, I'm here to tell you tonight something you already know. Uh, God says to you tonight, I love you. He says to me, David, I love you. But here's four more words that God would like to say to all of us. I love others, too. And God says, I love those people who are broke. I love the people who are homeless. I love the people who've made mistakes and now they're in jail and don't know where to turn. I love those people. And all through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, we find just case after case where God says, these people are a top priority for the kingdom of heaven. Psalm 146. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous, but the Lord also watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. 
And again, I'm not going to get political, but I just thought I'd think about the last four presidential administrations. So that would be Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, you know, red, blue, red, blue. And I think it's safe to say that there are seven words that have been very true for those last four administrations. And those seven words are, it's a mess down at the border. Now, again, not to go into politics, but here's a what if I would like for you to think about. What if the, somebody in Washington decided to make our little LLBN family a presidential task force to try to help the broken people at the border, the people who are fleeing from gangs and murderers and, and coming to the border because they're so desperate, people that God loves. And somebody from the White House said, LLBN, all of you folks here, you be a task force, we'll give you a budget, Try to find something that you can do to reach out and change life for these broken people. What could we do? And I think right away that we would all have to agree that we would do, first of all, four things together. Um, and here they are. Number one, we would have to set aside party loyalty. Number two, we would have to decide that we would value those that we serve. Number three, we would have to be practical. We'd have to try to think of things that would work. And number four, we would have to just keep at it, keep trying things. And even as we did these four things, we would have to acknowledge to ourselves and to the Lord when we prayed every night um, that this would never be a problem that we would be able to fix. I noticed just the other day something interesting in God's word. And if we were to think of a, a chapter in the Bible that really pours out what, what heaven thinks about the broken, destitute people all around us, we couldn't do better than Matthew 25. You know, the, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats, which we just heard a moment ago, uh, where God says, these are the people I want you to help, the poor, the homeless, the people that are in prison, people who are starving, people who are widows and orphans. These are the people. That's Matthew 25. The very next chapter, Matthew 26, Jesus levels with us when he says, but the poor you will always have with you. That will never be something that will go away. I've been reading a wonderful book right lately by a man named John Meacham, The Soul of America, a great Christian historian. And he talks about how Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, just had this idea that, 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 that people who care need to have just persistent experimentation, always being trying something to help. If something works and something doesn't work, set it aside, try something else. Keep the experiment wheel going. Always try to be doing something else. I have two ideals that I would just love to have happen anywhere. I got two lovely grandkids who live in Hoover, Alabama. And they have the most wonderful public library. It's great for kids. They have books for kids. They have magazines for kids. They have school, all sorts of resources for kids. You can go there on a Tuesday night in your pajamas and somebody will read stories to you. Jammy night. I think every kid in America ought to have access to pajama night at the library. Now, and it's all free. How does that happen? Well, all the people who care pay a little more in their property taxes and their highway taxes because every kid ought to be able to read books at the library and have jammy night. I personally think every kid in America ought to be able to, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great library. I think every kid in America ought to be able to go to Loma Linda Academy and not only have great teachers in math and spelling and Bible and science, I think they should all be able to wear tuxedos and sing in Brenda Moore's choir. Every kid ought to be able to do something like that. And so as we as God's people want to help the neighbor around us who struggles, we have to be smart. We have to be efficient. You've probably heard this line, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day and teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. I heard a wife trying to change that around. She said to give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, you can get rid of him for the whole weekend. And I guess that's probably true. But the biblical idea is that a man who, a man who has a skill, then the problem is taken care of. One of the most wonderful stories I ever heard is by Chuck Colson, former Watergate criminal, and uh, went to jail for his crimes, became a Christian, 
right before he came, went to prison. He came out, and with his new baptized heart, he had a heart for prison ministry. And Chuck Colson discovered a brilliant way of giving. Over in the Philippines, a lot of young men were in prison. They'd get out. They had no skill, no way to make a living. And Colson and his Christian friends found out that for $120, they could give a, a, a reformed ex-con a pedicab, a little pedal, pedal uh, taxi cab. And he could make a living and pay back the $120 in nine months and take care of his family. And Colson went to this little graduation ceremony for these ex-cons. 32 of these little pedicabs. He said, all these young men just out of prison standing by their shiny new pedicabs. And he said, and a little pretty little girl, four or five years old, ran up to stand by her daddy in his new pedicab. And this little girl, that tall, little beautiful brown eyes, looked up at her daddy with this adoring gaze. Because her daddy was home. Her daddy was a, a, a provider again. Her daddy was going to take care of business and bring home a paycheck and pay the rent and bring groceries home for her and her mommy. And this little girl, Colson said, just had these adoring eyes because her daddy was a man again. And Colson just said, wow. He said, I never knew that money could be spent so wisely. So the Bible says this. God loves those on the fringes. And we have to love those on the fringes too. Love one another is one of Jesus' great commandments. The hallmark of Christianity is, look at how they love. Look at how these Christians care for the poor and the destitute. In the Adventist curriculum for study every Sabbath morning just a few weeks ago, um, it made the point that God is the sovereign of the world, and he surely is, but he also cares about the fatherless. He cares about the widow. He cares about the orphan. And you may have seen this picture of this little boy from Syria who tried to escape from persecution with his dad, and he drowns. And God cares about that little boy. True religion is to look after the widows and the orphans, the Bible says. I think about the story of uh, Boaz and Ruth in the Bible, where these two widows, uh, Ruth and Naomi, come back from a long exile to a faraway country in this beautiful love story. First of all, Boaz says to his workers, uh, take care of her, help her, give her a chance. She was a gleaner in the field. And he quietly said to his gleaners, leave a little extra for this, for this lady. And then beyond that, uh, it's very clear that in the culture of Judea of that time, to protect the widow and her property and her name and her values, that was part of the importance of, of, of how they did things in that, in that culture where he, where, he, uh, where he took her name and offered to, be her, offered to be her husband to protect her livelihood and her reputation. All through the book of Deuteronomy, we find rules for, for judging fairly and for letting the, letting the alien in the land have have a fair shot in, in court. No partiality, no bribes. Don't deprive the alien, the Bible says, of their, of their day in court. Don't deprive the fatherless of receiving justice. The Bible says, cursed who is he who does. I was thinking of some prime examples in, in, in American culture. And I'll tell you just a real quick story. Back in the 1950s, a, a white writer, John Howard Griffin, made a decision to, to make himself black. He took, he took medicine to make himself black, finally covered up his skin, and he was able to pass for African American. And this is the 1950s in the Deep South. And he tells a lot of heartbreaking stories of what he had to deal with. He finally decided to take a Greyhound bus from Mississippi to Alabama, just the, the height of racial tension and prejudice back in that aching time. And so they're riding along, everybody who's African-American in the back of the bus, the sign says that, colored people behind this line. They come up to a rest stop, and they stop, and the bus driver says, the 15-minute breaks, folks, 15 minutes. And everybody in the front of the bus gets off, and people in the back try to get off, and the bus driver says, ah, I'm not letting you off. I can't be bothered tracking you people down. And the one man said, well, sir, he said, I, I've got to use the facilities. And the man says, you just, just get back in your seat. I can't be bothered. 
And this desperate man said, I don't know what else to do. He decided to do his business on the floor in the back of the bus. And there was some good nature cheering about that. And then the word goes out. These people are just too dumb to get off and use the restroom. And nobody says that the bus driver wouldn't let them off. Just heartbreaking prejudice and hatred and animosity. You've all seen this picture. Atticus Finch, Tom Robinson, young black man accused of rape back in the 30s, 1940s, in the Deep South. And it becomes clear in the course of this trial, he could not have done it. This terrible crime is committed by a man with a strong right arm. This young man here, his right arm is ruined. He was caught in a, in, a, in a farming machine. Couldn't have done it. And Atticus Finch stands and talks to these white, 12 white men in the jury. He says, gentlemen, it's core to the foundation of America. Every man, every man has a fair chance before the law. In the name of God, in the name of God, do your duty. One hour later, the verdict comes back, guilty, across the board. But it's the hallmark of what the Bible t- says to the people of God. The people of God need to ensure justice for the broken people of the world, justice for the downtrodden and brokenhearted. Uh, unfairness should not exist, the Bible says, in Israel, and also not in the family of God. So I want to say to you, this is the ministry of Jesus. The whole point of the Good Samaritan story is the passion of Jesus for the broken people. Lepers. The lowest people there was, lepers. And Jesus reached out to serve and to heal and to love the lepers. I mentioned uh, Chuck Colson. And he says this, Jesus was concerned not only with saving man from hell in the next world, but with delivering him from the hellishness of this one. I always like to read John Stott, one of the great Christian evangelical pillars of the body of Christ. We are concerned both for the sinning and for the sinned against, from John Stott. One of the hard things for you and me to do is to understand the experience of the suffering other person. I mentioned John Meacham, who says that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt somehow had a heart to know how to identify. He was a millionaire knew how to identify with the experience of broken people who didn't receive very much in life. Out at the college where I work, we sometimes, uh, some of us teachers, we, we pick a book and we all read it together and we have a Zoom book discussion. I just read a book by a young lady named uh, Diane Guerrero in the country she loved, we love. She was born here, but her parents were not. They were illegal immigrants. And we all have views on that. It doesn't matter what we think. God loves those people. But this little girl had to go to school every day. She was legal and have no idea if she would come home and find mommy and daddy there. And one day she came home and mom and dad were gone. She was 14. And for a few weeks, mom and dad were to jail 30 miles away. And she had to take a bus and go see them. And then one day they were just plain gone, gone. They were down to Columbia, South America, 14 years old. And so the Bible says to you and to me, we're people who have passports and driver's licenses and a a safe home and blankets on our bed. Love these people. Try to understand the plight of these people. Understand the hurt of these people. And you know, if we can see people the way Jesus sees people, Jesus loves these people. And if we can see them the way he does, and I can suggest to you, you may, you may see a young 10-year-old girl, and she looks a little different from you, and has a little different coloration than you, and maybe you might make an assumption about that person, and then suddenly you realize, oh, well, that's, a, that's David Smith's granddaughter, and he loves her. And then maybe your feelings might change just a little bit if that happened to you. Dan and I had an experience out in uh, Thailand. Um, when we were just arriving there, uh, and we were living, the, living in the town of Chiang Mai. We were really the only American family in a, in a long ways around. I remember a hurtful word, falang, falang. And I'm not sure exactly what that word meant, but I knew it was derisive. I think it meant 
foreigner, American, white person. There was an add-on word, which I will not add on. There's just added something a little even more unkind than that, Falang. So I experienced that racism coming in. And then one day I realized I had something to learn as well. Because I, I was a bright little guy in math, math professor today. And I suppose in fourth grade, I was already doing fifth grade math. And in seventh grade, I was doing eighth grade math. And by the time I was in eighth grade, I was peaking at algebra. And somehow I had the idea that surely all of these Thai kids around me, well, they were probably doing two plus three is five. Because I was the American. And they were doing two and three is five. And then one day I happened to peek into a Thai math book, and I realized that their algebra was just like mine. And that my great white boy algebra was nothing. And I realized that I had something to learn. And I'll tell you, folks, in God's eyes, we are all the same. This is the gospel. In, heaven, in heaven's accounting, we are all exactly the same. And that's why the Bible says, love the aliens, because you were aliens. I would like to suggest to you that the great story of the Exodus, these broken people who were slaves, two, two million slaves in Egypt, and God rescues them and takes them to the promised land. First of all, I believe that story is a metaphor for what God wants to do for all the broken people in the world. To rescue from the slavery of sin. Take them to paradise. But even beyond that, I would like to maybe suggest that God did the Exodus story. He took the slaves out of Egypt and set them on the path of freedom for the purpose of demonstrating that this is the gospel, that the rescue of broken people and taking them into the ideal of heaven, that is the gospel. This John Stott says, we come in and receive mercy, and then we go out and show mercy. And I'd like to suggest to you that when we get to heaven, we're all going to be illegal immigrants. We're all going to be alike at the front gate. Sing this little song with me. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. That's all of us. That is everybody. Let me spend just a few closing minutes with this idea. Do you remember what the golden rule says, Matthew 7:12? I like it from this message paraphrase. Take a look. Here's a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. But here's my question. What if, just, what if I'm just not wired that way? What if I'm, what if I'm inhibited? What if I'm a, a, an introvert? What if I'm just not wired to want to be out there serving and running a soup kitchen? Uh, well, I'd like to say four things to you. First of all, before I say that, um, this is a Bible's command. The Sermon on the Mount is not a suggestion. It's God's command to us. But I would like to give you four suggestions on how you and I can learn to love the biblical ministry of reaching out and serving other people. First of all, try to find an avenue of service that can bring you joy. There are many ways to obey Matthew 25 and reach out to hurting, broken people. Find something you can do that you love, that can make you happy. Now, it's true, there are just a few grunge jobs that aren't fun for anybody. After a potluck, somebody has to clean up, put the trash away, do the dishes. That's not fun. Somebody has to. And being a Christian, is, that's part of life. But for regular, ongoing, weekly, week in and week out service, Ask God to show you the one thing that you can do with joy. Secondly, everybody do one thing. Find one way that you can serve, that you can make a difference. One thing. The third one just jumped out at me the other day. If you're really struggling with how you can have this biblical orientation toward loving others, read your Bible. And something will jump out at you. Something in God's word will leap off the pages and say, David, that's you. That's you right there. That is what I want you to do. Happened to me just the other day. 
And number four, go to church. Mingle with people who are serving. Be around opportunities to serve. Listen to sermons where this is being articulated and something will happen and jump out at you. I got my brother Dan, who on a scale of 1 to 10 for extrovert, he's probably a 12. I'm probably about a 5. I got a wife, Lisa, she's probably a one and a half. And the other day we were going for a walk and she told me a story. She's been, she works for the state of California and everybody's Zoom. And a few weeks ago, she got an email from a coworker of hers named Gilbert. And this man is probably about 50 years old. He's a quadriplegic, Gilbert. And his 20 year old daughter was killed. And I got daughters, I could hardly imagine. And somehow in this man's broken heartache, he reached out to my wife, my introverted wife, Lisa. And he said to her in this email, he says, I, I don't know what to do. He says, I can't face going on. I'm never going to see my daughter again. He says, he says I'm broken hearted. And my introverted wife, who spent 65 years feeding her soul on the word of God, began to type back, and she said, Gilbert, she says, no, wait, wait, Gilbert, she said, you can be with your daughter again. We serve a mighty Savior. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. If you have a connection with Jesus and you hang on to that connection, you will be with your daughter again on resurrection morning. You can be reunited with your, with your daughter. And my wife told me that story as we were walking around the block, and all of a sudden, both of us were bawling. And I said to my wife, I said, honey, I said, do you realize God put you in that spot to share that message? If your whole career at that place was to give that message, that would be a ministry life well worth doing. Here's the last question I have. If you and I are mean people, selfish people, racially divisive people, um, people who are exclusive and superior, how many people out there will care that we have the, the Sabbath message? I can tell you, zero. Uh, the, the quarterly I mentioned said, yes, the children of Israel knew who the true God was. Yes, they had the correct forms of worship. Yes, they brought all the right offerings. That's all fine. But in the end, what good was all of that if they were mistreating the weak? and poor among them. And this John Stock closes by saying, we cannot announce God's love with credibility unless we also exhibit it in action.
Thank you so much, so much for joining us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please help us to have the kind of eyes that you have and help us to have the kind of hearts to love that you manifested at Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen.